Well, I'm so glad you joined us today. We are concluding our series, Building Strong Families. We've been on a journey examining the Ten Commandments, discovering that the Ten Commandments are not ten suggestions. They're not ten options. They're ten commandments where the Lord specifically gave direction in his word. And he said, if you do these ten commandments, if you follow these ten commandments, things will go well in your life. And if you don't, your life's going to unravel and fall apart. And it's always interesting. Anytime you talk about the Ten Commandments, there are always people who are like, well, I just don't know if I believe that. That's Old Testament. And you look at their life and their life's unraveling, and you will go, well, listen, if you'll do what God said, maybe your life will be put back together. And today we're going to examine commandment number 10. As we've examined the other nine commandments, I don't know if you noticed or not, but each of the previous nine commandments have their origin in the heart and mind of people. And then they find their ultimate expression in our actions. So when God says, have no other gods before me in our heart and our mind, we determine I'm not going to worship anything but God. And then we see that in our life. And we go through all nine of those commandments. But commandment number 10 has its origin in the heart and mind of people. And then it finds its ultimate expression through our physical activity, through our life. Exodus 20, 17, the Lord said, you must not covet your neighbor's house, you must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Coveting begins in the heart and mind, and coveting is fulfilled in our heart and our mind. Coveting is an inward sin. It's a sin of the heart. It's a sin of the mind. There may be some this morning that you are guilty of coveting and you don't care. Because there are people who have coveted and have no intention of repenting and confessing their covetousness. Just like in the video, the lady was upset because she got one size can of Coke and everybody else got a larger size can of Coke. And in the video, you saw her at the end of the video, how she was complaining to Jesus, why do you hold back your best for me? That's what coveting is. Coveting is being mad at God that he didn't bless you like he blessed somebody else. Why can't I have a house like that? Why can't I have a wife like that? Why can't I be rich like that? Why can't I look that good? Why can't I be healthy like that? And on and on we go, and we get mad at God because we think God owes us something. Maybe you're here today and you're guilty of coveting, and you think, well, nobody's going to know. That's true. None of us will ever know, but God knows. Psalm 139, verse 1, the psalmist said, Oh, Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. So we have an altar call now? Listen to me. The psalmist clearly says, The Lord has examined our heart, and he knows everything about us. On this journey of building strong families, this journey through the Ten Commandments, no matter what has convicted you, no matter what has pricked your heart, no matter what you've been guilty of, the stuff you're like, well, I'm not going to confess that because nobody knows, but God knows. And as we get to commandment number 10, I need you to ask yourself this question. Are you content or are you coveting? Are you content or are you coveting? So what exactly is coveting? Well, at its root, coveting is a result of envy. When a covetous desire clings to our heart, we are then headed toward more serious sins. Many times people interchange coveting and envy, but coveting and envy are really two different things. The focus of envy is another person. The focus of coveting is God. To, to covet means to have a strong desire for. Coveting is not just an appreciation of things. It, it's not sinful to notice, hey man, that's a nice car. I love when people get new cars. In fact, if you get a new car, bring it by and let me see it. I love to smell the new car. I love to rejoice with people who get new cars. You know why? Because it just lets me rejoice in what God has done for you and it keeps my heart pure and I don't become covetous and envious. It's okay to say, Man, your wife is beautiful. Man, your husband is very handsome. That's an amazing house God has blessed you with. It's okay to notice these nice things. But coveting is an uncontrolled, selfish desire. Coveting is a result of envy. So if you're taking notes, envy is resenting God's goodness to someone else while ignoring God's goodness to me. Envy is like, why wow, they get to have such a nice house and I got this cracker box I live in. When we fail to realize that cracker box you lived in was a blessing from God. 
Well, they get to drive that nice car, and I drive this little hoopty car that's paid for and gets, you know, 40 miles to the gallon. Envy, resenting God's goodness to someone else while ignoring God's goodness to me. Coveting is saying that God's provision isn't enough. Coveting is disagreeing with God about what you think you should have. In the video, she disagreed with Jesus over what size can of Coke she should have. I love this video, and here's why. Because you're like, really? She's upset about the size of a can of Coke? Oh, yes, we get upset about all kinds of stuff with God. Well, God, I think you should have given me more. That's coveting. When you're saying, God, you should have given me more. Coveting is disagreeing with God about what you think you should have. Envy and covetousness are both tools that Satan uses to distract us from pursuing the one thing that can bring true joy and contentment. There's one thing that can bring true joy and contentment. One thing. A big like this. One thing. One thing. It's God. God himself brings true joy and contentment. If you're looking for joy and contentment and peace and meaningfulness and everything else in life and anything else but God, you're going to be disappointed. But God brings joy. God brings peace. God brings contentment. Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. So let me ask you again, are you content or are you coveting? The, the text, Exodus twenty seventeen, the Lord said, you must not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. In the Hebrew, the word for covet is the word hamad, and it means to desire to want, to long for, to thirst or yearn for, to lust after, to take pleasure in, to delight in something. The word covet itself, covetousness, is a neutral word. Coveting can be good and coveting can be bad. Coveting can be, here's a big word, legitimate or illegitimate. Let me show you the difference. See, Scripture teaches the idea of legitimate covetousness. And here's what I mean by that. God has planted in each one of our hearts certain inalienable desires. We all have the desire for love, for peace, for joy. We all have the desire to be secure, to, feel, to be successful, to be fulfilled, to be satisfied. We all have those desires. Those are desires that God gave us, and those are desires that only God can fulfill. The psalmist says in Psalm 16 too, I said to the Lord, you are my master. Everything good I have comes from you. Psalm 73, the psalmist said in verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. This one's not on the screen, but Psalm 27, verse four, the psalmist said, one thing I have desired of the Lord, one thing I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. See, Scripture teaches us that our greatest desire needs to be God. You're looking for joy? Joy's found in Jesus. You're looking for peace? It's found in Jesus. You're looking for happiness? It's found in the Lord. You're looking for success? It's found in being faithful to the Lord. Everything you're looking for is being found in the Lord. James said in James 1.17, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting saddle. In Matthew 5.6, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. What are you desiring? What are you craving? Are you craving the things of God or the things of the world? In 1 Corinthians 12, 31, Paul said we should eagerly desire the greater gifts. 
In Psalm 19, verse 9, the psalmist said, Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. Look at verse 10. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. When we covet, when we desire the things of God, the things God wants us to desire, this is legitimate coveting. The focus of our desire is God and what he provides. Do you desire God more than anything? Or did you just catch that last part? Well, I desire what God can provide. Listen, you can't receive what God provides if you don't desire God. Several years ago, we did a sermon called Common Law Christians. And I said this, common law Christians want the benefits of a relationship with God without the commitments. If you desire the things of God without God, you're just a common law Christian. You want the benefits of God without the commitment to God. But if you will desire God and make him your ultimate goal, make him the one that drives you, that this one thing is my desire for God, then he'll grant the desires of your heart. In fact, Psalm 37, verse 4, the psalmist says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Notice the psalmist said, that wasn't on the screen, but the psalmist said, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will grant you the desires of your heart. So many people are like, God, just give me the desires of my heart. I want to be rich. I want to be famous. I want to be good looking. I want to be healthy. I want to be popular. And we desire all these things and want God to grant the desires of our heart, but God won't because our heart is focused on the wrong things. He wants us to desire him. Illegitimate coveting is when our hearts and minds are set on some possession. It's when our hearts are so consumed with getting something that we become gripped and enslaved by the thing we desire. Our heart becomes focused upon a possession or something other than God. Now listen, illegitimate coveting is the bad coveting. Coveting is always a trap. It's a trap set by Satan. Satan wants to get us to focus on things rather than God. Satan says, well, I thought God loved you. He does. Well, why didn't he make you rich? Why didn't he make you successful? Why didn't he bless you with a family like that? And he, he makes up all this stuff. Well, if God loves you, why didn't he do all this stuff? And in those moments, you've got to just say, shut up, devil. People love to say, Well, I know money doesn't make you happy, but I'd sure like to try it. But you know what? Money's just a tool. And sometimes I notice it's easy for us when we don't have money to go, it's just a tool, I I don't need money. But yet we secretly desire more money. But it's just a tool. But when we make God our desire, when we say, God, I long for you, I desire you more than anything, we begin to notice that God takes care of the necessities in our life. And we find and discover true happiness. I like what, I like what John wrote in 1 John 2, 15. He said, do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Did you see that? When you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Which is more valuable to you, the things of the world or the love of our Heavenly Father? That's what John said. When you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Verse 16, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Notice John mentions three cravings here in 1 John 2. In some translations, older translations, it says, instead of cravings, he says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I want us to look at these three cravings that John teaches about. First of all is, is, is a craving in verse 16, the craving for physical pleasure. This is also called the lust of the flesh. To crave for physical pleasure is to desire what the world desires. And a craving, you know what a craving is, right? A craving is defined as a powerful desire for something. What is it you desire more than anything? You had cravings, right? Cravings for something sweet. Oreos. 
Every now and then, after dinner, we'll sit down and I'll say, anybody want ice cream from Sonic? And everyone's like, nah, nah. And I'm like, man, too bad, too bad. But every now and then, somebody goes, hey, we should get Sonic after dinner. And I'm like, yes, let's go. Because there's something about when I eat, I desire something sweet after that. You do too. Do we need to talk about pumpkin pie and pecan pie and all the stuff we just had this week? We had Thanksgiving and we give thanks and have a great feast and after the great feast, we have great sweets, don't we? That's a craving. When you desire something, to crave something is the mindset that I have to have it at once. And, and John tells us that craving for physical pleasure is desiring what the world does. Now listen, God gives us a choice for what we will crave. If you're craving what the world does, you're choosing that craving over the craving the things of God. See, God gave us a will, and he will not violate our will. In fact, today, you can focus your desires in any direction you want. You can desire, you can crave anything you want, and God won't stop you. He wants you to desire and crave him, but he can't make us desire and crave him because that would go against the will that he gave us. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, the scripture says, Now listen, today I'm giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and keep his commands, decrees, and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are about to enter and occupy. Moses is giving these instructions to the people of Israel. Today you get to make a choice. You have the same choice today. Will you choose God? or the other things you're craving. In Matthew 7, Jesus taught in verse 13 and said, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult. Only a few ever find it. Joshua 24, 15, Joshua told the people, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. See, God created us to love and God created us to have desires. But the problem is, so many people are like, well, I can pick my desires. I'm going to pick what makes me happy, but God wants to be your greatest desire. God wants to be the one that makes you happy more than anything else. That's why Paul wrote in Philippians, and he said in Philippians 4.8, now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. You can write that verse down. You can memorize that verse. And when you begin to examine your heart, what kind of things do you crave? What kind of things do you desire? The right cravings, the right desires are found in Philippians 4.8. Are they true? Are they honorable? Are they right? Are they pure? Are they lovely? Are they admirable? Are they worthy of praise? If the things you crave are not Found in Philippians 4, 8, you're craving the wrong things. Romans 13, verse 14, Paul said, Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Every day, we decide what we will desire and what we will pursue. Craving for physical pleasure is to desire what the world does. The second craving John mentions in verse 16 is craving for everything we see. This is lust of the eyes. To crave for everything we see is to desire what the world offers. This is an overwhelming desire for the accumulation of things. This is materialism at its finest. I got to have more stuff. More stuff's going to make me happy. You've seen the bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins. That's what the world says. Get all the toys you have, get all the stuff, and you'll be successful. But that is not success. That's materialism. Like, how many cars does one person really need? How many houses does one person really need? We love to watch house hunters. And we're always amazed. These people that are buying their second or third home, and it's like $2.5 million. And we're like, what do you do for a living? And are they hiring? Because, I mean, we can afford the house we have, and you're buying a second or third home. Nothing wrong with having second or third homes. But what are you pursuing? What is your greatest desire? You see, these material things, they only provide temporary satisfaction. 
That's the things of the earth. They provide temporary satisfaction. Remember in the garden when Satan came in the form of a serpent and attempted Eve, and he, and he, and he, he convinced her that what he had to offer, the fruit of the tree, was going to open her eyes and give her everything? Genesis 3, 6 said, When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Satan twisted God's word and deceived Eve into sin. He does the same thing in my life and in your life today. He's still twisting God's word and leading us to desire the wrong things. Remember the story of Achan in Joshua 7? In Joshua 6, God delivered Jericho to Israel. And God made a statement. He said, everything in the city is consecrated. Everything is set apart. Everything is holy. It's mine. And he's like, don't touch my stuff. Don't take my stuff. But Joshua 7 tells us that Achan, as he was going through Jericho and God was fighting a battle, he began to desire some things that were the Lord's. And when Achan's sin was exposed in verse 20 of Joshua 7, look what it said. Achan replied, it's true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw the plunder and the plunder, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, when I saw 200 shekels of silver and I saw a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Achan basically said, I wanted these things so much that I took them. Was it wrong for him to notice those things? No. He should have said, man, God's getting a blessing today. Look at that gold. Look at that robe. Look at that silver. The kingdom of God is going to be heavily invested in today. But instead he said, you know, I could use those. See, the, the root of materialism is insecurity, and Achan felt insecure without those things. The root of materialism is saying, you know what? I need to look better than the Joneses. No offense if your name is Jones. Have you noticed that we are always trying to impress people by getting more stuff. And we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even really know or don't even like. That's materialism. See, money will not buy happiness. Things will not buy happiness. Happiness only comes from delighting in the Lord. Jesus taught in Matthew 6, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Do you delight in the Lord or are you pursuing and desiring other things? The third craving that John mentions, he talks about pride in our achievements and possessions. Pride in our achievements and possessions is to desire the world's approval. It's the pride of life. Verse 16, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. This is the person who wants to be noticed. And if I only had this position, I could be important. I want to be noticed. So many times we, des we decide that happiness is a destination, but, but happiness isn't a destination. Happiness is being content in the Lord. Happiness is like, you know what? God is mine and I am his. No matter where I am, I got the Lord. There's a song that was going through my head this morning. It said, Lord, you are more precious than silver, more costly than gold. Lord, there's nothing I desire more than you. There was another song that said, you can't take God away from me. You can take my life, my land, my liberty. You can take God away from me, but I'm still going to be free because you can't take God from me. When God is your greatest delight, when God's your greatest desire, nothing else is going to matter. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. When you're filled with pride, when you're doing things to make yourself look better, that's really a covetous spirit. You're doing things to impress and please people. When we get to heaven, God's not going to ask how many people were impressed with you. God's not going to ask how many cars did you have. Was it fast? Was it cool? He's not going to ask, what, how much money did you make? He's going to say, what was your greatest desire? Was it me? What did you do with my son? I gave my son for you. Did you receive my son and make him your greatest desire? I love what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Why do you do what you do? Is it for God's glory? 
Why do you work so hard? Is it for God's glory? Why are you accumulating the wealth you're accumulating? Is it for God's glory? Why do you pursue success? Is it for God's glory? Why do you do what you do? So John shows us these three cravings. So how do we overcome these cravings, these fleshly cravings? There's two ways. First of all, knowing and using God's word is the only effective offensive weapon against coveting. You've got to know God's word. And you've got to use God's word. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you know God's word? It's one thing to know his word. It's a completely other thing to use his word. Know his word and use his word. Like in Psalm 37, the psalmist said, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. God, would you, would you bless my life? And God says, commit your way to me and I'll, make it, I'll, make it, I'll bring it to pass. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. To use God's word effectively, we have to have faith in God's promises. We sing about that, having faith in his promises. Paul said that his promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Do you have faith in God's promises? Like Psalm 37 and verse 7, he says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. We don't have to stress. We don't have to fret. We don't have to worry. We can rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do you believe his promises that when we wait patiently for him? You know what Isaiah said? Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You're tired, you're weary, you're worn out, the holidays already got you frazzled. How about just be still and wait on the Lord and be made strong in him? How about where the psalmist said, be still and know that he is God? Do you trust the promises of God's word? Listen, to use God's word effectively, we have to put faith in his promises because Satan knows the scripture and Satan's good at twisting the word of God to suit his purposes. So you've got to know the word and you've got to use the word. There's one more thing we can do to overcome these fleshly cravings. We, we must know the word and use the word. But secondly, we must crave the things of God more than the things of the world. Crave the things of God more than the things of the world. Listen to me. I'm not saying success is wrong. I'm not saying money is wrong. I'm not saying desire and achievements is wrong. But God should be your greatest desire over all those things. In Galatians 5.16, Paul said, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. See, when we crave the things of the world, that's illegitimate coveting. And the sin of coveting is destructive. Without a doubt, the sin of coveting is the most serious Infection that can corrupt our heart. So how do we guard our heart against illegitimate coveting? How do we protect ourselves from the destruction of coveting? We did it this week. And I hope you don't just do it one time a year, but I hope it's a daily thing that you do. Thanks and gratitude. On Thanksgiving Day, what were you thankful for? So much stuff. What about the day after Thanksgiving? Were you still thankful? What about yesterday? What about today? You see, that's why Paul wrote in Philippians 4 and verse 6, and he said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. It's hard to worry and be thankful. You'll either choose thankfulness and gratitude or you'll choose to worry. So Paul said, tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. What do you need? I walked in this morning at the end of worship practice and Pastor Kelly said, what does it, anybody need anything? And I said, I need a million dollars. That's my answer. If you ask me what I need, I'm going to tell you I need a million dollars. Just because it's fun to say. Paul says, tell God what you need. Lord, I need peace. Lord, I need healing. Lord, I need direction. Lord, I need wisdom. Lord, I need strength. Lord, there's so much that I need, and I'm just going to tell you what I need. And then he says, and thank him for what he's done. And you know what's amazing? When we tell God what we need, and we switch gears and begin to thank him for what he's done, all of a sudden we realize he's done more than we need. He's done above and beyond what we could ever ask. And then Paul said in verse 7, then you'll experience God's peace, 
which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You know what's amazing? It's when we have the peace of Christ guarding our heart, we aren't covetous. We aren't illegitimately covering. We're not sinfully coveting because my heart's at peace. Remember the old song, it is well with my soul. When you can confidently say, it is well with my soul, you're not desiring everything because your soul is well, your soul is healthy because your greatest desire is the Lord and he fulfills everything that you need. And when he fulfills everything you need, it's well. It's well. A coveting heart will rob you of your joy and happiness. A coveting heart will keep you from praising God for what he's given you. And God desires that we be content and grateful regardless of what we have. Are you content? Well, if I had that million dollars, I'd be content. No, you wouldn't. Are you content? Well, if I had a spouse, no, you wouldn't. Are you content? Well, if I drove that, no. If I lived there, listen. Here's the secret to being content, and I promise I'm done. Psalm 23, verse 1. The psalmist wrote, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. When God is your greatest delight, when the Lord is your shepherd and you know that your shepherd guides you and leads you and provides for you and cares for you and meets every need in your life, he is all you're desiring, you have all that you need because the shepherd takes care of it. And so if there's lack, I go to the shepherd. Lord, I feel like I need this. He says, now you don't need that. Just trust me. Okay, Lord. But Lord, I really think this is a need. It's not, just trust me. Lord, are you sure? Because this is really pressing and I really feel like this is a need and I need you to intervene. I need you to make a way. And he says, am I your shepherd or not? Oh yes, Lord, you're my shepherd. Then just trust me. If I'm your shepherd, you have all that you need. All that you need. Isn't that amazing? I don't have to desire everything. I just have to desire one thing. The Lord. I desire the Lord. Last year, sorry, I got to tell you this. I wasn't going to, but it, the Lord told me to tell you this. I feel like he did. Last year, we, our church got a bill from the county tax assessor, and it was like, I don't know, 30-something thousand dollars. And I was like, oh, God, what am I going to do with this? How am I going to pay this? And I began to worry, and I began to fret, and I began to think, well, let me see. If, if I don't get paid, that's not enough. And if I don't pay anybody else, that's, and I started trying to figure it all out. And finally, just praying about this every day, I just said, Lord, you're my shepherd, and I trust you, and God, I got a need, and I need you to take care of it. And I set it away, and I went on. And can I tell you that before the year ended, God met the need, and then some, and the first business day of this year, I, with a smile on my face and joy in my heart, went down with a check that the church had printed out, and I was like, I just want to pay my tax bill. I was so excited to pay that tax bill because I knew where it came from. I didn't have to be covetous. Well, I wish, we, I wish our church had more money. I didn't have to beat you up and say, well, I wish you people would just tithe. I just trust the Lord. The way I trust the Lord for the church has to apply to my life as well. The Lord is my shepherd. He's the shepherd of Christian Center, but he's the shepherd of Joe and Jennifer. We trust him. We know he's our shepherd, and we have all that we need. What about when you don't have what you need? The shepherd will take care of it. And until he takes care of it, my responsibility is just to be thanks and gratitude. Lord, thank you for all that you've done. God, I praise you for how good you've been. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you've been so good to me. And I want to thank you for how good you've been. Amen? Let's pray today. God, thank you today. God, you're so good. You're so faithful. You're so trustworthy. Thank you for giving us these 10 commandments. Thank you that they aren't 10 suggestions. They're commandments. You gave us biblical principles to build our life upon. And if we will follow these 10 commandments, we will build strong, healthy men and women, and we'll be, we'll be strong individuals, and we'll have strong families. Holy Spirit, I thank you today how you've been moving throughout our, our service this morning, up and down the rows, up and down the aisles. You've been touching hearts, and maybe there are some here today that the truth of the matter is they've been desiring stuff. They've been desiring things of the world more than the desiring God. 
Maybe they're here this morning, and when I said, what's, what's the one thing you desire? Something else came to mind, and it wasn't God. And they're guilty of illegitimate coveting. Holy Spirit, would you bring us to a place of repentance today that we'd say, God, I'm sorry for desiring anything else than you. And God, teach me to trust you. Lord, help me to know you as my shepherd. And I can declare like the psalmist declared, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. God, give us hearts that covet the things you want us to covet, the desire and crave the things you want us to crave. Like we would crave holiness. We would crave purity. We would crave wisdom and gifts of the Spirit. We would crave peace that the Holy Spirit brings. We would crave the things that you want us to crave and to desire the things you want us to desire. Oh, Holy Spirit, work in our hearts. And in this moment, bring us to a place of repentance and help us to change our direction and help us from this moment on to live like Paul said and said, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all for the glory of God. Let us from this moment on live our life for your glory for your honor, desiring the things you have for us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching and worshiping with us today. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a video or a live stream. And please share this video with your friends and family. If this message has encouraged you today, please let us know in the comments as we would love to connect with you. And thank you so much for your generosity. Because of you and your faithful giving, together we share the gospel around the world. So please visit our website, crumbcc.church, and use the giving link. God bless you. We can't wait to worship with you again next week.